Good morning and welcome to the new church of Boulder Valley. Um, thank you for being here for our live service today. And uh, we hope that you're doing well. We are working on potentially having people worship with us in person in the next week or two, but we'll keep you informed about that. But for today, today we're glad you're here. Glad you can collect wherever you are and uh, worship together. It's important where we can come and hear the Lord's word, hear his promise of hope and uh, truth and um, this comfort, all those things that the Lord provides us with when we get together in worship. So thank you for being here today. Uh, we're going to start in just a moment with our first song called Holy, Holy, Holy. And uh, there are materials on the website. If you get them, you can sing along with those. So let's begin.
Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Our Lord and Savior, we come before you today knowing that life has many ups and downs. We have times that are difficult for us, challenging for us, and times with great joy and peace and promise. This is the part of our path of life. Lord, when things are difficult, we pray that you fortify us with this truth of your word. Give us courage and encourage us to keep going, keep doing the right thing and to follow you, knowing that at some point things will subside and we will find peace again. There is a cycle of our lives, Lord, just like there is night and day. Help us to remember that and help us to trust in you and where you're leading. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses, as we also forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Well, we're going to start this morning with talking with the children. Good morning, children. It's nice to see you. I hope you're doing well. I wanted to ask you if you've ever built a boat in your life before. I've never built a boat, but I imagine it's a lot of work. And you can imagine, too, if you've ever built one, you probably know that it would be a lot of work. But our story today is about someone who was asked by the Lord to build a boat, and actually they called it an ark. It was a place where the Lord would preserve him and his family and all the animals and creeping things and birds that would be saved because there was a flood that was going to come. And you probably know the name of the person I'm talking about. His name is Noah. So what happened is the story is that People had turned away from love. They had turned away from kindness. They had turned away from the truth. They had turned towards only selfishness and hatred. And the world was about to be flooded with, well, it was going to rain and there was going to be a flood. And it was going to destroy all the people on the earth and all the animals and all the birds and all the creeping things. But the Lord called to Noah and said, Noah, please build this ark and you and your family and pairs of uh, seven pairs of clean animals and birds and creeping things and one pair of unclean animals, birds and creeping things shall go in the ark and fill it with food so that you'll be ready to survive this time and then the flood will come. So Noah did that and he filled up the ark and it started to rain and it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights and the earth was flooded with water and everything that breathed on the earth died except what was inside the ark. And in time, it came after about 150 days that the waters receded from the earth. And Noah sent out ravens to test and see if there was any dry ground and then dove. And finally, the dove brought back a branch, knowing that there was life again. And eventually, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. And then Noah and his family was able to come out of the ark and all the animals and the birds and the creeping things. And the first thing that Noah did and his family did when they came out of the ark was that they worshiped the Lord. They built an altar and they worshiped the Lord. So let's talk about this story a little bit. Um, and we think about the story, we think about, well, when we think about the ark, we usually think of something like, like this, probably. This is my artistic rendering as a, an ark. And this is what you usually picture, I think, when we think about an ark. But that's not exactly what it was like, based on what we're told in the story itself, it looked a lot more like this. So it was very long. It was probably about the size inside of something like a big King Supers or a Costco, that kind of a, a store. And it had two parts to it. One part was sealed off. So this whole part was sealed off. And it didn't have a, a flap like this, but it had three different 
levels, which maybe you can see a lower level, a middle level, and a top level. And it had one window on the side there and a, window, a door up above as well. And it was covered with pitch or tar, and that's what the ark would have looked like. So what is this about? Well, the Lord tells us that each one of us needs to build ourselves an ark. And we're like, well, why? Well, an ark actually is a picture for us of what is called our conscience. Maybe you've heard that word before, conscience. You've maybe heard the phrase, let your conscience be your guide. And really what a conscience is, is a place where the Lord can speak to us and be present with us. So that maybe if we're tempted to be unkind to somebody else, you might sort of hear that voice inside, if you know what I'm talking about, or that feeling inside that says, oh, I shouldn't do that. And that is your conscience, or that's the Lord speaking to you. Or if you have this temptation to take something that somebody else's, steal it for yourself, you might have that voice inside that says, oh, I, I shouldn't do that. And that is our conscience. And each of us actually has to build one. Because there's going to be times in our lives, just like in this story, where we, where we are flooded or overwhelmed with, with maybe a desires to do the wrong thing, or maybe some false ideas, ideas that are not true, that might overwhelm us, and we need to be ready for that. And so the ark is like our conscience that helps us to stay afloat so we don't drown in those things and be carried away by them. So all of us are building one right now, and the Lord is helping us with that. And the way that we build that is by special memories called remains, where anything that you do that's, that's happy and positive, that's good, maybe a little child that's being nursed or held by their parents, or when little children play together and you have fun together and you enjoy each other, that happy memory is stored up. That becomes part of what helps to build your conscience. And also right now, as you were about to read as part of the Lord's word, when you hear the Lord's word spoken, you learn those truths. Or maybe as you know the story of Noah, that helps to build your conscience. And when you stop doing what you know is wrong or do what's right, that helps. It. So anytime that we have all those experiences, the Lord is actually building up that conscience for us that will help us to get through those hard times. Now, at the end of the story, we talked about how Noah came out in his family and they worshiped the Lord, which is a great reminder to us, is to always to thank the Lord for how he helps us through hard times. But the last thing was that the Lord said a rainbow. He saw a rainbow in the cloud. And how many of you have seen rainbows before? Probably most of you have. But it's always a wonderful thing, right? It's always exciting when you see a rainbow, you're always going to tell somebody, hey, look, there's a rainbow over there. And sometimes you see a double rainbow. But it's always a special thing. But rainbows always come after storms, don't they? Maybe there is a big storm. Maybe there's thunder and lightning. Maybe it's a little frightening. But at the end of that storm, when the sun starts to come out, you'll see a rainbow in the cloud. And that rainbow is a promise that the Lord gives us. Now, I'm going to read this story and then tell you a little bit more about that. So after the story, after Noah came out of the ark with his family, it says, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant. And the covenant is like a promise. This is the sign of the covenant or promise which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, which just means forever and ever. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant or promise between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant or promise between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, the sign of the promise, which I have established or made between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen. What the Lord is saying by making this promise of a rainbow in the cloud is he's saying, I know you're going to have hard times. You're going to have difficult times in your life, sort of like a storm of life. But know when you see the rainbow that I'm always there that I'm always leading you, I'm always protecting you, and I'm trying to help you to get to heaven. And this rainbow is the promise or sign of the promise that the Lord makes to all of us. 
It's interesting, too, the Lord says that the rainbow is kind of like what truth is like when we have it in our mind. It's this bright, beautiful, colorful thing that helps us to know that the Lord is there, that the Lord is helping us. So this week, as you think about it, maybe, you'll, maybe there'll be a storm, maybe you'll get to see a rainbow, and that will be a, a precious thing. And you can think about how the Lord is always with us, no matter how difficult things may be. There will be a rainbow following. There will be a promise, a reminder of the promise that the Lord is there. So we can always do things to help build up that conscience, to strengthen that ark, build up that ark inside of ourselves. Remember to have special times with people that are happy and fun and kind and to learn what's true and to turn away from what you know is wrong and do what's right. When we do that, that conscience or that ark is built and it helps us to get through. Well, thank you for listening this morning. We're going to sing our next song. This is called All Night, All Day. I invite you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. Lord, we pray that you protect your children. We pray that you build within them a strong conscience that will help them to know the difference between wrong and right and to choose well and wisely as they get older. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening. Children, you are welcome to stay, of course, and be part of what we're doing next, or maybe you have projects to do. But thank you so much. Have a, a safe and peaceful week. And now we're going to continue with some more readings from the Lord's Word. This next reading is, is a summary of the story of Noah, and so there's a lot of things that are skipped out of it, but you'll get the general idea. It's from portions of chapter 6, 7, and 8. There were giants on the earth in those days. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. So the Lord said, I will destroy humankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God said to Noah, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, 
you shall bring two of every sort into the ark. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth one hundred and fifty days. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and of all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided, and the waters receded continually from the earth. And then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And it came to pass that the waters were dried up from the earth. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for humankind's sake, although the imagination of their heart is evil from their youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And then from Secrets of Heaven, portions of 935, it's talking about how we have alternate states of, of good and bad. It says the fact that a regenerate person experiences alternations, that is to say at one point no charity resides with them, and at the next some charity, is perfectly clear for the reason that with everybody, even the regenerate, nothing but evil exists. Everything good with them is the Lord's alone. Because nothing but evil exists with them, it is inevitable that they undergo such changes, at one time living, so to speak, in summer, that is, in charity, and at another in winter, that is, in no charity. The result of such changes is that a person is being ever more perfected and so made ever more happy. Such changes take place with a regenerate person, not only during their lifetime, but also when they have entered the next life. For without changes like those of summer and winter as regards things of the will, and like those of day and night as regards things of the understanding, they are in no way perfected and made more happy. In the next life, however, people's changes are like those of summer and winter in temperate regions, and like those of day and night in the springtime. Amen. Here in our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Anyone else just sick of, tired of all that's going on? The pandemic, economic hardship and racial injustice, hurricanes, oppressive heat, fires and politics. If I wasn't a non-believer in Armageddon or the end times, I would think, these are the end times. This is the end of the world. If I didn't believe the second coming already happened, that the Lord came in his word or the heavenly doctrines, I would think that Jesus is on his way again. But if we are honest, we would say that there's been a lot of hard things. But there have also been blessings. There's been good things that we've experienced in this time. There's been a slowing down been more time spent together with family, spending more time outside, more people waking up to injustice and taking action. When there are things that are hard, there are two things that come to mind for us that make it even more difficult. And those are different beliefs in our mind that one, that it's, persuade, that it's pervasive, and number two, that it's permanent. By pervasive, we mean things that spread through into everything and can't be escaped. And permanent meaning that it's never going to stop. It's going to last indefinitely. That this is how things will be forever. And it can sure feel that way, though, but it's, it's not the truth. And hell and evil spirits like to reinforce negative experiences and states that we are in in thinking with these kinds of lies, that it's going to be permanent and it's pervasive. But we need to come back to the understanding that parts of us that don't work are specific. There's a specific issue going on, and it's temporary. And we need to hearken back to times in our life that we're good, because we will go there again. We'll experience that again. We can say, yes, this is bad. This moment is bad. But there are other parts of my life that are not, and this hard thing will pass. And states fluctuate. We know that by now. We've lived long enough to know that states go up and down. We have difficult times, and we have pleasant and good times. But why do things fluctuate so much? Well, the simple answer is that we are not here just to ride out life. That we're here to learn and to grow, to be transformed. And that can be painful, and it can take a lifetime. I should say it will be painful at times, and it will take our lifetime. But we can't say that the Lord doesn't prepare us or warn us about these things. There's all kinds of stories in the Lord's word of difficulties, people going through hard things, and how the Lord rescues them or lifts them out of it and leads them out of it. And the Lord gives plenty of beautiful passages about peace and love and joy and how the Lord is leading us to those things. Like Psalm 16 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the Gospel of John, it says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. And he says again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. If we had a choice, I think all of us would just say, well, just give me the peace, just give me the joy, just give me the happiness. I don't want any of the sadness, I don't want any of the grief. 
of the hardship. The fact is, sadness and grief and hardship are part of life. You can't have happiness without experiencing the contrast of unhappiness. There's value in those down states or dark states of our life. And the variations help us to appreciate what's good and true, what is truly of love, what is truly of light. Think of a simple example like a pencil and paper drawing where the, what makes it beautiful or really stand out is the light and the shadow that goes with it. Or the beauty of dawn after a long night. Or after the hardship of winter, the beauty of spring that comes. And it's just built into our world. We see it all around us. It's like the Lord tells us every day, guess what? There's going to be dark and light. There's going to be nighttime. There's going to be daytime. It's, it's baked into our daily life. So that's there to remind us of how life will be. And when we have sorrow, it's a testament to the thing that we love. So when we love someone, we miss them when they're gone. Sometimes we're afraid to love because the cost is high. And when they're gone, it hurts. But gr our grief or our sadness is, is an expression of love. We grieve because something we love is lost or suspended for a time. And that's a normal and natural reaction to feel that way. So the fact is our states will vary. We will have ups. We will have downs. As the Lord said, in the world, you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Or in Psalm 30, the Lord says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Notice those two buts in those phrases. You're going to have difficulties, but it's going to get better. There will be joy in the morning. It will be hard for a time, but it will get better. So these difficulties help us to know just how good the good times and good things are that we're experiencing. But the real point of these fluctuations and these ups and downs is that they help us to grow and experiencing, and because of that growth, we can experience deeper and better and everlasting states of happiness and joy. Because those ups and downs help us to shake off and remove selfishness and hellish tendencies, things that keep us separate from true happiness, peace, and joy. So can we strive to adopt an attitude that there's a God who's in charge, who's trying to get me and everybody else possible in this world to heaven? so they can have a state of eternal joy and peace. There's this passage from Secrets of Heaven 5963. It's talking about these various states that we go through. It says, For they who are in the perception of the Lord's presence are in the perception that each and all things which befall them tend to their good, and that evils do not reach them, hence they are in tranquility. Without such faith or confidence in the Lord, no one can possibly come to the tranquility of peace. Thus, neither to the bliss and joy, because this bliss dwells in the tranquility of peace. So the Lord's saying, if we don't have that mindset that whatever's happening, be it good or bad, is tending to our good, we can't experience the peace and joy that the Lord wants to give us. It's a really important idea that whatever's going on, the Lord is using this to build my eternal happiness. Using it, not causing it, but using it. So I want to look at the story of Noah in this context. It's one of those examples of ups and downs where things get destroyed, but they're built up again, where things are hard, but there's a, a hopefulness at the end. But it's interesting, the story that leads up to the story of Noah, like at the beginning of Genesis, you have the creation story, you have the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, and then Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. And then Cain kills Abel, his brother. And this happens right before the story of Noah. Well, these stories are symbolic, as we know. And Cain and Abel symbolize two different things. Cain pictures faith, and Abel pictures charity. And what it pictures is that charity was no longer a thing or, or living or an important matter to people in the church. And after this chapter where Cain kills Abel, there's this chapter between, before you get to know of these genealogies or begats, as you might think of them, where somebody has this person and they had this child and this child, and finally gets down to Noah. But that picture is the descent. Once charity leaves the barn, once people are, think charity doesn't matter, that faith is the only thing that matters, the church takes a nosedive. It says, faith separate from love, its brother. So Cain separate from Abel, or faith separate from love, its brother, regards charity as being worthless 
and so annihilated it. Like those who nowadays assert that faith alone accomplishes salvation. So the Lord's saying the same thing's going on in our world today where people think faith alone is what matters. It doesn't, charity doesn't, is not a factor. We can annihilate it. A real, and there's a real disconnect between what being a truly a religious person and how it's okay to live. The Lord even says that nowhere else is the way people live more despicable than in the Christian world. He's saying, in the Christian world, we're the worst of all. We talked about this a couple months ago. Why? Because, because people separate faith from charity, that's why people who say they believe in Christ or believe in the Lord can support racist policies or racist behaviors, or why they can believe that they're better than others, or that they can hold what's true and good as irrelevant. Because faith is faith in name only, and it's separate from charity, which means the heart, life, and the attitude doesn't change. The only thing that changes is what you say you believe. And so all kinds of things that are destructive can happen. So what needs to happen? Well, we need to be touched. We need to be moved. We need to wake up. We need to be willing to be different. A part of us that can be touched and can be transformed is what's pictured by Noah in the story. It says Noah was a righteous and a blameless man which means that he could be endowed with charity. He could change, is what it's saying. There's a part of us that can be endowed with charity, that can grow and change. And then there's a quote that says, Noah walked with God, which says it's not what we are, but what we are capable of becoming. So we can become something so much different. We can become people that walk with God, that are endowed with charity. We're capable of having a beautiful heart, beautiful intentions, and a beautiful life but it does require some construction on our part. We need to build an ark. We need to build a conscience, is what that ark symbolizes, both as a species collectively in this world and as individuals. And conscience is referred to as a bond which holds us in thinking, speaking, and doing what is good, while at the same time withholding us from thinking, speaking, and doing what is evil and false. It's something that holds us in that place of love and goodness and keeps us away from that place of hatred and unkindness. So the Lord's saying he wants to make a covenant with Noah is that the Lord wants to make with us a promise or a covenant, a place where the Lord can be or how the Lord can regenerate us, create a space where he can dwell and have a voice in our mind, in our heart. Think about among all the competing voices and cries for attention in our life, conscience is like the voice of the Lord in our mind, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing a way for the Lord. It's kind of like what you see in the story of the children of Israel, how they had the ark and how the cloud or the fire, pillar of fire would descend upon the ark and the Lord would speak to them. It's the same thing. It's the, the conscience is the Lord within the Lord's presence within us, speaking to us and guiding us. So if we'll, we are willing to be changed, the Lord uses all of our beliefs, all of our truths, all of our goods, even our mistakes and our misguided parts to build a conscience. All the beasts and the birds and the creeping things that the Lord gathers into the ark or that Noah gathers into the ark at the Lord's command are represented, it says some of them were unclean, represent all the parts of our mind that are, you know, some of them are mistaken, some of them are messed up, but the Lord uses them all to try to change us and help us. The Lord uses everything in us. It says, the Lord can use anything that we believe to be true or good to help build a conscience in us. And that's an amazing statement. Think about it. It goes to show that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to know everything. We just have to want to be different. We have to have the willingness to grow and change. Because as we know, there are times in our life when we are overwhelmed, where there are floods coming into our life. And this flood in the story pictures a flood of falsity and evil persuasions. And I think that word is telling, that word persuasion, because desires are evils that want to persuade us to try to behave as we know we ought not to. The writings say, the influx of delusions and desires from evil spirits is not unlike a flood. So if you've ever had that experience of just being overwhelmed by a lust or desire or false thinking, it's what, that's what's being described here in the story. But how are we going to be protected from that? How are we going to be guarded from that taking us and destroying us. Well, that's what conscience is. We need to build one, and we need to dwell in it, and we need to let it 
lift us up above all the things that and not be swept away by the desires of the world. That's what pictured by the flood and being in the ark. But being in the ark and being, you know, on the water and trapped inside for all that time for 40 days and 40 nights of rain and then 150 days being in the ark itself pictures temptation. The purpose of that temptation, which is not fun, which is hard, just like being stuck in the ark would be, is that we may receive new life. So the external side of us can be subdued and serve the internal side of us. So selfish loves can be crushed and evil desires subside. And then from, as the writings describe, being a dead person, we can become one who is alive. And the ark eventually comes to rest on Mount Ararat. Ararat means the light. So we can be brought to a new light, a new place where we can see and have more enlightenment. But in the story, it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights, and then the ark for 150 days. And that number 40 always pictures temptations or trials or difficulties. And how much is this like where we are in our life? They were in the ark for 150 days, and it's been just a bit over 150 days in this pandemic where we've been various degrees of quarantine and isolation. Being bound up in the ark feels very much like that. And now, just like in the story, there. You know, Noah sends out a raven a couple of times, see if it's safe to go out, and they send out a dove. The dove eventually brings back an olive branch, and then eventually the dove doesn't come back because it's safe to go outside. And that's kind of where we're trying to figure out, is it safe to go outside? But there's a reason we go through these difficult things, because temptations get rid of the bad stuff inside of us. The point of temptation is to make quiet the lies and the hellish desires that drive us, that want to flood us, that overtake us. So listen to what the writings say as they describe it in Secrets of Heaven 8, 9, 6, 7. Since, since temptations serve to strengthen the truths of faith and to implant forms of the good of charity and also to subdue cravings for evil, it follows that temptations are the means by which the spiritual or internal self gains dominion over the natural or external self that is, the good of charity and faith gains dominion over the evil of self-love and love of the world. Once this has been accomplished, the person becomes enlightened and enjoys a perception of what truth is and what good is, and also of what evil and falsity are. This brings them intelligence and wisdom, which increase daily after that. So we only go through hard things so that good may come the kind of good that can have a permanent effect on our lives, have a permanent impact. And we can't see that at the time. We don't know why it's happening. We just know it's hard. And I don't want to downplay the difficulty, but it is difficult, but it does have a purpose. As the Lord said, things will be hard. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, after the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat, that new state of light we experience, Noah comes out of the ark and his family, and they build an altar, and they worship the Lord. And that's a great reminder to us. is like, what's the point of all this time in isolation, this time in the ark, if we aren't going to emerge a little bit different, more grateful, more alert to the presence of the Lord and the Lord's purpose for us all? Can we bring ourselves and our community, communities, our country, into a place where love and charity rules, where empty claims of faith and or faith separate from charity or love aren't heard any longer. Charity means love, there's a quote, charity means love toward the neighbor and compassion. For anyone who loves their neighbor as themselves also has as much compassion for them in their suffering as they do for themselves in their own. So the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself. We have that same kind of feeling that when others are suffering as we would if it was us. And I like this passage from Arcanus Luscious 364. It says, the devil and his crew is at hand when a person is devoid of charity. It's no wonder that bad things happen when we're in faith alone, when we're devoid of charity. Only one thing will drive the devil and his crew away from the door, and that is love to the Lord and charity towards the neighbor. The only thing that's going to drive that away is love to the Lord and love charity toward the neighbor. So this is a long path to get to the point that I want to make. But the Lord says, after the end of the story, the Lord says this phrase that seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. We will have alternations of state for, of good 
and hard and light and dark, times of clarity and confusion, times of hope and despair, all of those things, they will not cease. This will be so for the whole time of your life. You'll have alternate states, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. So we'll have states of love, we'll have states of cold, times when we're engrossed in self-interest, and times when we're very kind and charitable. We will have fluctuation always. But can we try to make it a point to try to grow from those times, become alert to the divine plan, that there is or there may be a heaven from the human race for ourselves and for everyone that God has created? And can we take time daily to help build the ark or build a conscience for ourselves so that we can stay afloat and be a voice of reason and goodness perhaps in the world and so that we can grow and that the Lord's voice may dwell within us and become stronger and more clear. So have those positive experiences where kindness and good are happening and learn the Lord's truth and shun evils of sins against the Lord. And when you go through temptations, keep going. You're going through hell, keep on going, try to get to the other side so the Lord can strengthen that conscience, strengthen his voice within us so we can live in that state of peace and trust. Amen. Will you pray for just a moment? Lord, thank you for the knowledge of what you are doing every moment to build a conscience within us where you and your voice may be heard and you may be felt, where you can be present in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our daily life. Help us to do the work, Lord, of helping to build that conscience so we can stay afloat during the difficult times and be led to that mount of light, that higher place. Amen. Now may the Lord preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forward and even forever. Amen. Now we'll sing our last song, Psalm 91. Thank you.